very much everybody really happy to be talking to many people some names i recognize many i don't it's really great to see the wider family of molsoft and those of you using icm um, i'm actually not going to talk about computational chemistry and i'm not going to talk about structural biology i'm actually going to talk about something we did during the pandemic here in oxford in, in the uk uh, that used a bit of icm that probably many of you are not using which is the SCARAB component, which is what we use for data management at the Centers for Medicines Discovery. So what I want to tell you about is, is, is the story of how my pandemic went, basically, and the war stories I have along the way. Uh, it kind of all started um, in March of that year when, when the pandemic first started, when uh, kind of week three, when the UK went down in lockdown and I was twiddling my thumbs and I was wondering what we were going to do for probably six months, maybe nine months, because we weren't going to be able to be in the lab. And I thought, this is good. We're going to be able to get some papers written. Um, but then um, I got a phone call and uh, I got a phone call from Professor Sir David Stewart. And you won't know who he is, but of course, if you get a, a phone call from someone who has, who is a knight of the realm, so Sir Dave, you're going to pick it up and you're going to say yes to anything that he says. So he, he, he said to me uh, on this Sunday afternoon in early April, Brian, we're building a high throughput ELISA serology assay and we need a data management platform in the next two weeks. Can you help? And I said, uh, maybe. Um, he, I said, what do you need? He said, well, um, we need end-to-end -end data management. We need to make sure that we are tracking the samples that are coming in we're tracking how we are arraying them on the platform. We're tracking uh, the data that comes out of the platform. We're checking that that data is, is good. We're analyzing it. And then we're gonna have to deliver the, custom, deliver the data to the customers within 24 hours of running the assay. How, how quick do you think you can do this? I said, well, I could probably do normal times, get this done in maybe nine months, 12 months. I said, no, you have two weeks. Um, and I said, okay. Um, not really knowing quite what I let myself in for. And it turns out this was a very big enterprise um, within the UK that involved um, the UK government, whoops, the UK government in particular, uh, something called the Office for National Statistics, which is a, a, an organization which provides a lot of data for many of the main departments of uh, the, uh, the UK government. And we at the University of Oxford had said that, uh, perhaps fairly blithely, and said that uh, we'd be quite happy to receive uh, tens of thousands of samples per day um, from uh, over 500,000 500, participants, or so half a million participants across the UK. So that's uh, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, this, uh, this is something that would have to be done in, in seven days from when they started it. And so this, this, was, this was something we'd never done before at this speed or at this pace. And it was frankly quite frightening and daunting, but on the other hand, this was a pandemic and we wanted to help. So we partnered with our local healthcare organization uh, in the National Health Service, which is the Oxford University Hospitals Foundation Trust, and also with uh, an industrial partner, Thermo Fisher, and I'll talk more about them in a minute. So um, this COVID-19 infection survey that we'd signed up to do, was to really test uh, how many people were positive for COVID-19 at any point in time, whether they reported symptoms or not. So we were not just looking or uh, taking samples from those that were positive, we were taking samples from all half a million regardless. And we were doing that over the course of every month, a sample would be taken. Uh, and that the idea behind that was it would give the UK government an idea of the trajectory of the uh, pandemic, of the infections per week uh, during the study. Uh, and of course, that also tells us how many are test positive and how many have had the infection or may have been vaccinated. So we decided that we probably needed to, to come up with a couple of assays to, uh, to, to work on this. Many of you will, will recognize pictures like this of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, the main thing that we looked at was the spike proteins, the bit that sticks on the outside of the actual virus itself, but also uh, the, something called the nuclear capsid, which is involved in packing of the RNA inside the virus as well. Uh, on average, we were receiving 6,000 serology samples per day. So that means is blood samples. So it'll usually involve doing a pinprick of your finger and then taking the, 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 the blood sample. 
And the platform had to run seven days a week, 363 days a year. So we didn't do Christmas Day and we didn't do New Year's Day, but every other day had to happen. And it was on a shift pattern. And on average, we were doing around about 12,000 ELISA experiments a day. So this is, this is way beyond anything that we'd ever tried before. And the timeline was very aggressive at trying to, to get this platform up and running. So we started in April. Um, and we had various phases and various milestones and deliverables that we had to, to, to meet in terms of being able to get the contracts in place, being able to scale up, doing the validation of the actual platform, because this was a diagnostics platform or a research platform. And that therefore required us to have uh, a validation of it for us to be able to pass um, the, the requirements of MHRA, which is the UK equivalent to the FDA. And there are lots of things about making sure we have pre-coated acid plates uh, and so on and so forth. But we had to have the data management platform available by this point so that we could sign the contract. So this was all really rather uh, challenging. So how does this how does this platform actually work? Well, the, the actual experimental platform. So the idea is that we work on 384 well plates. Um, the serum samples are loaded by robots into the appropriate wells. Um, we have uh, plates that are pre-coated with the protein, so the spike protein in each of the wells that Thermo Fisher provided. And then we add the serum from the blood samples um, to the well. And then we look to see if there are any antibodies against the antigen uh, using a standard ELISA approach where you have a helper antibody that then either fluoresces or uh, uh, produces a color that you can pick up uh, in a spectrometer of, of some sort. Uh, and so it's as simple as that. It's, it's really simple, but you're doing across 384 wells. And here you can see an example of some that are very dark, where it's very positive, or very light, where it's not positive. Getting the antibodies for the antigens um, is really important in terms of benchmarking. And we were very fortunate that we were able to collaborate with the Gavin Screeton group in Oxford that were rapidly developing recombinant antibodies against spike and event against the nucleocapsid protein. And it isn't simple because you've got to make sure that you're binding the right epitope of the actual antigen. And we use cryo-electron microscopy to help us with that. It's got to bind consistently. You'll be surprised how inconsistent some of these antibodies can be. Got to stay within the assay window. Got to be stable. And you've got to make loads of it consistently. And you've got to prove in a calibration that it, it meets standards that are expected. And we were very fortunate that we were able to find a number of antibodies that you can see here against a standard, which is a CR3022, that match really closely. And that then allows us to be able to do calibration and normalization of the data that comes from the actual experiments themselves. So this is what the platform looks like. Um, there's actually two platforms that are all enclosed in uh, these enclosures, all robotics uh, using an Agilent Bravo for the liquid handling and centrifugation. Um, thermo robots, robotics for plate, plate uh, logistics. So you can see here the, the arm that's moving the plates around that zooms back and forth, up and down this enclosure. And then there's a multi scan plate reader at the very far end, which you can't see, um, that actually reads the intensities of the colors. And then there are other bits and pieces that we have as well. And, and we, the university, decided that we would buy this at risk even before we signed the contract. So we spent two million on this hoping that we would get the contract, which we did. And nominally, we can do 48, 384 well plates per eight hour shift. So you can see how this is very intensive. So as I said, we needed a data management platform. And to do this, you've got to understand how the data needs to flow. So, you know, you get your tube, it isn't, doesn't look exactly like this, but you get a tube from each of the participants that arrives at the local hospital. It has to be unpacked. Um, each one comes in its own plastic bag, and we're getting, you know, sometimes 10,000, sometimes 6,000 a day of these. So we required a small army of, of people who are unpacking these. Um, they need to be receipted. Uh, so we need to scan the barcode off them. We need to make sure that they link properly with the, uh, the upstream uh, patient identifiers. Then we need to run the assay itself on each of these samples. Then we need to process the data that comes out of that, stick it in a database, check that we're happy with the data, and then deliver it to the actual customer itself, perhaps uh, via a CSV file. And there are different components along here. And the bit that I'll show a bit later is how SCARAB was used 
specifically on the data quality control and the data delivery. But as I'll show you in a second, we did quite a lot of work upstream of that in terms of the data capture. So this is the complicated slide. Uh, it looks more complicated than it is. We can divide it up into kind of three swim lanes. We've got sample management, data capture, and data storage. So as I said before, we receive a sample, we run it through an assay, we do some processing on it, and we send it out to the actual customer. And in the middle, we've got uh, web interfaces that allow uh, the people who are running the platform to be able to upload the outputs from the actual uh, uh, machines, the, the liquid handlers and plate readers, um, and for that data then to be actually uh, uh, calculated and, and analyzed going into a core database. And then we use ICM Scarab to be able to interact with that core database to be able to do uh, data mining and data export. So this is an example of the, the web platform that we built. We called it Eliza Limbs because we weren't feeling particularly uh, uh, clever. And it just, just, that was just the name we came up with. We should have come up with a better one, but it was what it was. Um, and there are different, you see here, there are different parts of the actual workflow. This is the dashboard that shows, you know, on this day so far, no plates were run, 10 were run yesterday, 28 were run in the last seven days. This, by the way, is a screenshot from the very beginning when we were ramping up different projects with different number of, uh, of plates or samples run. Uh, and we, this is an example of an interface, very simple because we didn't have time to make this fancy. We had to stand this up in a matter of weeks, uh, being able to capture the metadata around how each of the plates was run, each of the 384 plates was run, and a, a kind of a, an interactive interface to the R scripts that ran in the background did a lot of the analysis. Um, so you click the run button with all this information with the uploaded file, and it would do the calculation and push things into the database for you. And then you can get visualizations like this, which is the 384 well plate visualization with the actual raw readouts from the plate reader. So you can start to see things like how many are read in, in the core parts. Those ones are very positive. And then in columns one, two, 23, and 24, where we put our controls and calibrants, making sure that we're seeing the right sort of gradation of color and therefore the right sort of gradation of the, the controls and calibrants themselves. And then we can also show the uh, a dashboard of whether this plate passed QC and there are various parameters associated with that, which I don't have time to go into. Um, the QC is actually super important. And because we had well-defined standards in terms of the, uh, the uh, antibody titers, um, we were able to check for interplate variation. And this is very important. Uh, one plate doesn't necessarily mean, it doesn't run the same way another plate works because there's always some variability in the manufacturing. And so what we can do is have an expectation of where each of the dil dilutions of the control antibodies should be. And we want to make sure that the actual values that we get once we've done the calculation sit within uh, the right uh, range uh, of expectation, usually within one standard deviation. And, and things like that are what make it easy for us to be able to do the, uh, the QC. We also have to keep an eye on the assays over time. And so what that means is for every day, we want to calculate the, the daily nor mean normalized signal just for each of the uh, controls and calibrants. Because again, we want to make sure that there isn't drift over time um, in the assay. And every night, the past three years, I've been going through this, this data, apart from Christmas Day and New Year's Day, um, looking for problems with the platform um, because uh, often this is the first sign that maybe something has gone wrong on the platform that we haven't spotted. And that's happened multiple times, and I'll show you that in a minute. There was also differential expectation of the data quality. So the spike protein, the data was re being reported back to patients or participants. So there are strict constraints around how we uh, report that. We've got to be very, very sure that the data we're providing is correct. The nuclear capsid that was really only for research purposes, so no one really worried so much about that. Okay, so that's fine. I've explained the background to, how, to all this. This is all about making sure that UK government makes smart decisions about how to move forward in a pandemic scenario. Um, one of the big things that we had to do um, was find ways of being able to reproducibly uh, share our data from this platform with the UK government and other partners. And it dawned upon me fairly early on that, you know, we're, we're going to have a, a database of all data in. Um, and actually, we need Scarab to be able to ask questions about data. But why don't we use that to template 
um, the actual reports that we can just then run and then send off to the government very, very quickly. So we wanted fast and reliable results retrieval, getting the customers for their reports, spotting problems, and critically, um, the contract stated that you know we didn't get paid until we delivered the data. So this was a way of making sure that this happened. So um, I'm going to run the risk now of running a, a, a little movie of what uh, ICM SCAB looks like in the context of ELISA Mims. Um, Hopefully it, your internet connections are not too slow and you'll be able to keep up, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, for those who have not seen ICM SCAB before, this is the web version actually. ICM is running under the hood, you don't know it, but it is. And what it's showing is a data structure that represents the database underneath. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play this movie and it's gonna show you some of the bits and pieces that we built in here and how we use it. So hopefully this all works. So that's the data structure. And then if we look in the plates, you can see there's lots of information like the plate barcode, information about quality control, dates when things happen, more information about quality control. Each of these is actually a, a single uh, field in the database. And then there's another folder that talks about the antigens uh, and the lot numbers and so on and so forth, the actual serum samples themselves, including the serum source ID, which is often very different, where they are on the plates, whether there are any issues, then the actual readouts from the uh, plate readers uh, relative to the well ID, so it might be an OD or fluorescence intensity, different temperatures and the quality. And then the actual normalized and standardized um, data that comes from the actual processing, um, which is the data that actually gets sent out um, to uh, the government or to whatever the customer is. So um, I'm just gonna pause it for a second here. Um, that's the kind of a tree structure on the left-hand side, which is kind of representative of anything you can do against any database. Uh, that's what ICM Scarab is good at. You can interface it with any given database and represent that database in a way that is somewhat user-friendly. And then on the right-hand side here, there are actually uh, an ability to be able to build reports or what we call queries. And um, the, the way that works is this top part here is where you drag and drop things from the tree here and uh, which constrains uh, the, the report. And you drag and drop things into the bottom half that actually uh, tells you, or, or actually specifies what data you're gonna get. So if I, if I continue the, uh, the movie, you'll see this. So what I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to uh, run a very simple query, first of all. I'm gonna drag the plate barcode uh, across down here and you see uh, it's gonna show plates and, and I'd quite like to know uh, the date that was run and actually why don't we say that the date had to be I don't know um, maybe March the 2nd let's see yeah I did remember correctly so now I can run that and that's showing me all the plate barcodes that were run on that day we only ran 13 for whatever reason but that that's how it was but we can go a little bit more complicated than that we can say well I would like to know uh, for each one of those plates each well um, what happened um, so uh, we'd, quite, we'd like to get the monoclonal quantitation. So that's the final value that we report. Um, we want to know what the sample ID is and we need the well ID. And, and let's just rearrange that to make sure that it kind of makes sense. So we want a plate ID, well ID, serum source, and you get the idea. And here is the actual results. And it is as quickly as that. Um, and you notice that I only have a thousand uh, rows so far, so I have to change it to zero to get it to everything. So actually there are 4,992 data points that were generated that day. So it's a fairly quiet day. Now, uh, not all the wells contain samples. Some of them are controls and calibrants. So I only want to have uh, the wells that contain samples in them. So what I do is I drag and drop the well type across to here, which will pop up in a second. And I'm gonna change that constraint um, to be samples. So here we are. So that's going to be a sample. And I'm gonna run the query again. And now down at the bottom, you see that there are now 4,160 rows um, associated with that. And critically, I can now export that to Excel or CSV or to JSON, whatever makes sense. So that very briefly gives you an idea of the sorts of things that we can do with Scarab. We can build really complicated questions very quickly and we can save these as templates to run later. So if I move on to this next slide, so this is um, an example. Of, this is actually the template that we use 
to deliver to the, the Office of National Statistics. Uh, it's far more complicated than I've got time to go through, but you can see at the bottom down here, the actual numbers and dates and, and so on and so forth that we're delivering. And we just export this as a CSV file and push it onto their site. And that is what we do before 10 o'clock each morning. And then the ONS then take that data, so that's us here, uh, bring other information in, including inf more information about the actual UK population, they model the data and then start producing information for the government um, about you know, how things are going and also providing information to the public um, that are perhaps a little bit more digestible. Um, so it's all about the processing and the analysis and the dissemination by the ONS. And so the questions they're trying to answer is who's protected? Were the antibodies waning? So in other words, um, were the, uh, the vaccinations wearing off? Um, did booster vaccines increase antibodies? Now we know the answer to these questions now, but at the time we weren't sure. Um, so uh, this resulted in a very big paper in Nature Medicine right at, uh, actually got sent off in December, 2020, it took a while to get through. Um, but this was uh, involved lots of other questions as well, but that was a, a very big deal uh, in the UK. Now, not everything goes well all the time. And um, those of you who've been involved in robotics know that this is not a trivial enterprise. Even just integrating bits and pieces on a robotics platform is really hard. None of us had ever done anything at this sort of scale before. We had to train staff. We had to keep staff because this was not, an, not a fun thing for many people to do, but people were willing to do it because of, of the, the pandemic. We often had problems with reagents and there was major plastic wear problems at the beginning of the pandemic. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And we had to communicate with many different stakeholders in many different areas, academia, the health service, the government, uh, industry, you know, the FDA equivalent. And so um, for the last three years, 8 a.m. every weekday morning, we've had calls, basically a stand up to go through any issues that have happened over the last 24 hours to keep things going. It's been very intensive. And things don't always go well. So, for example, one time um, we started to see a drop off in the numbers on the QC and I, I flagged it and I said something has changed on the platform because the antibody levels have suddenly dropped and everyone said no nothing's changed nothing's changed and after a couple of weeks we realized um, that what had happened was at some point um, rather than using Agilent tips on the actual liquid handlers we'd had to move to uh, a different company Fluotics uh, because Agilent couldn't make enough for us to have because there was a general plastic, plastic wear shortage. So what you can see is with some of this electron microscopy is that you have these really nice smooth edges, oops, really nice smooth edges on the Agilent tips, but only slight burring. Um, but on the fluotics, we had major burring, and that meant that um, in the dispense part of the actual assay, a, a lot of the uh, liquid was sticking to the, the bottom of the tips or the top of the tips. Um, and therefore the volumes that were going into the platform were incorrect. So that was that was that was a problem, and you can see this in more detail here. Here's the agilence, and then we've got all this nastiness going on um, in, in the fluotics. So that was fun, and there were other issues as well. So we, when the the boosters were rolled out uh, at the back end of 2021, um, of course that changed the general level of antibodies across the whole population. So here we're looking at the the uh, antibody titers and the populate the, the, the how many samples we receive. From that from the 1st of November 2021, so that's before the boosters, and you know 82% of the samples were within the assay window. Okay, that's fine. By the time we, the boosters had been rolled out in early December 2021, and then we get to the 5th of January, um, now 68.8% were beyond the assay window. So we knew that we had to move away from 1 in 50 dilution to something else. But the big question was what? And I haven't got time to go through this in detail, but we tried different dilutions and we had to make sure that um, we uh, didn't have significant changes in the levels of detected and not detected. And in the end, we plumped for one in 400, which showed the best correlation. And then when you do that, so this is what we had before, one in 50, and then one in 400, you can see now we're up to 97% all within the same samples, or all within the same sample window. Now, the data uh, at ONS is uh, pushed out uh, weekly. Um, lots of different people involved, as I've said, 
uh, lots of dissemination. Um, things are sent as a slide pack to key stakeholders. Separate HTML document goes out fortnightly on the websites. Um, various articles have been published, as, as I've said. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the, this is a, a picture of the almost daily uh, uh, calls that existed at number 10 Downing Street, often with the prime minister involved, but here's the health secretary, and here is our equivalent of uh, Anthony Fauci. And they were using our data in their presentations to the country, which was uh, very cool, but often quite frightening as well. And then lots of data like this, which was relatively easy for people to digest, so a bit like spark lines, was also made available. Many papers from this, I think we're up to around about 40 or 50 papers, of which half you might consider to be in high impact journals like the Lancet and, and so on and so forth. So um, I think this has really enabled things enormously. And um, this is just being used um, in Oxford. Um, it's also been used in a number of uh, Southeast Asia company, uh, countries, and in particular in Thailand, in Bangkok, where they have a, a similar system and we have a similar implementation of ELISA limbs. Um, although they've been using that for COVID-19, they have, as you will understand, a wide range of tropical pathogens, and, and we're providing the data management support and expertise. So this is a, a platform that is being used um, extensively. Okay, I'm getting to the end now, and, and Andy's not said five minutes, which is amazing, because usually I overrun, so that's good. Um, so how, what did we actually do at the end? Um, so in the end, just, just, just focus on these bottom numbers here. Uh, we actually closed down the platform um, last week. We push, pushed our last samples through last week because the UK government's decided that enough is enough and the pandemic is over. Um, so in the end, uh, we received over three and a half million samples. Um, we ran over 15,000 plates and delivered over 5 million data points. And the one thing I want to point out here is this thing, Oxford Vaccine Group. So we only ran nine plates, 966 samples, but these, uh, this data is uh, absolutely underpinned um, the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, which many of us, uh, especially in this country, were treated with uh, uh, for uh, COVID-19. And so it, it's well recognized this platform was not only a very, very big in terms of uh, ONS data and the UK government, but also to enable the vaccine development itself. So some conclusions. Um, we were the key partner with the UK government and ONS to track the progression of the pandemic in the UK. Um, critical data for the vaccine. We had to work, I had to work very closely with industry, government, healthcare and academia and everyone was very stressed out, as you can imagine, because we were all under massive uh, deadlines in terms of time. Um, and um, we had to find ways of being able to speak the same language, which was not always easy. And we had to be able to be sensitive to the, the stresses that our colleagues in different areas were, were placed under. But I think given the situation, it worked incredibly well. We set up a production diagnostic, not research platform, in a really record time in a research environment. That's never been done in this country before. And critically, Scarab was essential. If we hadn't had Scarab, we wouldn't have been able to spot many of the problems that occurred on the platform. And we wouldn't have been able to deliver the data consistently at the highest levels of quality um, that our customers demanded. And frankly, we're exhausted. We are not missing the 8 a.m. in the morning meetings. And uh, we're not missing, uh, I'm certainly not missing having to look at, at the data every night at seven or eight in the evening and spend a couple of hours checking that it's all okay. So I, I will stop here. Um, many, many people to acknowledge, um, and I'm, I've, I've missed dozens of people that ought to be on here. Loads of senior people from within Oxford, um, uh, many of whom went above and beyond to make it possible. My team in terms of, uh, of actually developing the data management part of this platform, we've had over 100 platform scientists running those robotics or dealing with the samples coming into the hospital.